Okay, well, let's see if we can do a, a one take stream of consciousness um, expression of a, at least my version of the, the theory of the adjacent possible. So this is a reference to Stuart Kaufman's theory of the adjacent possible and has been significantly influenced by conversations with uh, Greg Heinrichs and his theory of the talk, the theory of knowledge. All right, so here's the notion. Let's say you've got a, uh, a garage, and in the garage you've got a bunch of piece parts, uh, Legos. You have uh, some ability to put Legos together, and the, the notion is that on occasion, when you put Legos together, um, there's like a, a click and some new piece part emerges. Right? I'm trying to make this simple. So let's say you've got 100 Legos. Well, the number of, of possible combinations, or I can have every pairwise connection, then I can also have every triadic connection, every four connection, all the way up to every 99 connection. Right? So it's a very large space. This is Stewart's theory. Right? A very large space of possible combinations. And I essentially have three inquiries. All right, and that now I'm going to start going further into the into. I don't know whether or not what I'm saying is is straight mainstream Stewart's theory or, or or just my own sort of weird variation on it. So just bear with me. All right, so I've got my my box of a hundred pieces, and I, I start putting them together, and then I get a click. All right, something new has happened. Now here's the key. Now I have a hundred and one pieces. All right, so the space of combinatorics went from a hundred things that I can potentially put together in all these different configurations to 101, right? And of course that increases the whole space uh, geometrically. And at the next click, I now have 102 and the whole space continues to go up geometrically. Um, all right, now here's the thing. I'm going to identify the, the sort of the, the combinatorial of all possible combinations as the possibility space, possibility space <clears throat> one. And then, and then when I move to a new, so if I move from 100 to 101, I've gone out to a possibility space two, 101. So there's a, and, and there's some sort of a volume. I'm just going to use volume to represent the notion of, of geometry. So as the, as the number of, of things to be combined increases, the number of possible things increases at a at a rate that is is has a geometric relationship with that, <clears throat> some kind of exponent. Okay, now here's the trick. As I'm um, increasing the, the, the space, as I'm increasing the volume that could be explored, the possibility space is increasing. But I still actually have two fundamental constraints. Um, the first constraint is something like the, the number of combinations I can actually test given uh, finite time and energy. Right? So, so each time that I go you know, test, that takes time and it takes some amount of energy. And assuming I have both finite time and energy, there's actually a, uh, a finite number of, of tests that I can undergo, All right? So uh, if I imagine that as a, a, a sphere of a different color, superimposed on my previous sphere. So listen, my first sphere is uh, um, uh, white, my second sphere is red, then um, let's say for in the, in the beginning, I go into this garage, I have 100 objects and I can test, um, you know, one combination per second, and I'm not going to do the math right now because it's a stream of consciousness right off, right off the cuff. Um, that describes a, a sphere of number of tests that I can actually do. And let's say for the moment that that's bigger than the number of tests. So I've got three pieces. I can definitely take all three, you know, one, one, one with two, one with three, uh, two with three, and then one, two, three together. Done. Did it work? Yes or no? Okay. So the sphere of red, the sphere of number of tests that I can do and the sphere of white, the number of tests that could be done, there's a relationship between the two. Now, as I get a yes, the number of, of, of tests that could be done, right, the white sphere, increases. Now, here's the question. There's a point at which, um, when the white sphere is bigger than the red sphere, the rate limiter on my capacity to be in relationship with, generatively, with the adjacent possible, is actually the red sphere, not the white sphere. And so, as I continue to explore and find clicks, I'm increasing that white sphere. But if my red sphere is not also increasing, I start actually finding myself limited by this search through an, an increasingly large space, right? And, and at some point, there's like a moment of, of overwhelm. For those of you who happen to be human beings on the internet, right now you may be familiar with this notion, 
right? The possibility space of relationships that we can currently engage in is not just vast, it's sort of hyper vast and hyper vastly larger than our current capacity to discern which relationships to actually engage in. Right? So there's a there's sort of a possibility space. There's a mechanism to select the which of those possibilities to actually invest time and energy into. And then the third move is there's a degree to which the actual consequences of those relationships has a, a generative impact. And what I mean by generative impact here is, remember my, my, my blocks, right? I have a, a hundred blocks. Let's say I can, I can only test, say, uh, 10,000 combinations. Right? So which of all the possible combinations do I actually test? That's the second move. And what's the process by which I make that choice? Right? That's, you know, it could be random, but random's not going to work very well for very long. Then I've got the, okay, what actually happens? If I start putting them together, uh, do I get any clicks? Did I increase my possibility space at all? Um, and to what degree, this is the really super nuance, to what degree did my particular click increase my red sphere in addition to or symmetric with or maybe even more than the white sphere? All right, so let's, let's look at this in, the, in, the, in a more concrete. So that's the abstraction, right? I've got those three moves. I've got the, the, the actual size of the possibility space. I've got the mechanism by which I select the finite number of actual experiments or combinatorial possibilities that I can run. And then I've got the actual generative consequences in relationship to A, does it increase the size of the possibility space? And B, does it, does it increase the size of my, uh, the red sphere, my capacity to select? Okay. Now, if you look at this in the context of, say, complex chemistry, which is actually where Stuart uh, began the process, um, I have a bit of what's called a portal pathway. Portal pathways, I think, are going to turn out to be super important here. Um, so uh, complex chemistry space is the, the, the sort of this, the set of combinatorials, the combinations between um, uh, molecules. Right, so in the beginning, I've got certain kinds of molecules that can or can't connect, and then I get a, I get a click. Right? I get hydrogen and oxygen connect, and now I've got water. And water is a different kind of thing than just hydrogen and oxygen, so the, the possibility space just increased a lot. I can have a whole bunch of other kinds of, of combinations, and of course I can have water now combining with other kinds of, of molecules. So I get this huge milieu of, of the combinatorics that can happen inside complex chemistry space. Um, okay, now, now I want you to think about a particular location in complex chemistry space, which has to do with this, these three, three kinds of complex chemistry. One is known as DNA, one is known as RNA, uh, and one is known as a, uh, a, cell, a cellular membrane, or a lipid membrane that has, all, all of these have characteristics with, uh, in each other. Now, let's say for the moment that I happen to have, by sheer chemistry, lucked upon a particular configuration where I have a bunch of amino acids, nucleotides, coordinated into a relationship of a double helix DNA, coordinated into a relationship of, of a strand of RNA, and coordinated into a, a complex of a cell membrane right, by sheer complex chemistry. Right? Now, what's the likelihood, what's the probability that in the next, that there's, a, that there's going to be a uh, in the next moment or in any future moment, I will arrive at an absolutely identical copy of that same chemistry. Right? In, in complex chemistry space, the probability ver verges on zero. Right? It's just stochastic combinations. I may get DNA and RNA and cell membrane again, but the likelihood I'll get the exact same one, effectively zero. But then we have this other thing, this other tool, this other red sphere, right? this other way of, of searching the, the combinatorials available in complex chemistry space, which is known as um, cellular replication, right? mitosis, DNA synthesis, where um, the very specific characteristics that were unlocked in the innovation and the discovery of DNA, RNA, and cell membranes give rise to the ability to copy that exact set of complex chemistry into a new cell with a probability near one. Right, so my body is made up of trillions and trillions of cells that successfully copy each other. In fact, copy each other with complex branchings of exactly how they differentiate almost perfectly, almost all the time. Right? And so compare that to what would happen in just sort of stochastic random chemistry. 
And of course, this insight, the whole, the, this insight of the, the unbelievable uh, collapse of the, the probability landscape into a very, very narrow bound of what actually happens is the thing that Stuart was, 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 was working on. So that's the, the insight of the space. So we have that example. Now, okay, let's take a look. Now I'm going to branch into um, uh, Greg's work, uh, talk. So the same kind of threshold, and I'm going to use the, the concept of a portal pathway, which I'm not sure if I've described it before, but it's a cool concept. I have the, the set of possibilities in complex chemistry space. Then I kind of unlock this super cool combination that has a, a radical shift in the, uh, the, the red sphere, which is to say a radical shift in the, the set of, of experimental or the, expe the set of combinations that are actualized that gives rise to um, what it turns out to be a whole new landscape, a whole new milieu. Right? So now we're in life space. Right? Life space is different than complex chemistry space. Life space is governed by this new probability landscape um, the, 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 of, of DNA, RNA, and, and cell membranes that radically changes the, uh, pro the exactly what um, piece of the total space of complex chemistry is in fact where you're searching, right? You're only searching inside that space, looking for very specific combinations of um, complex chemistry that are fully compatible, 100% compatible with, um, with, with DNA, RNA cell, right? And now, of course, but there's lots of variations in there. There's a whole new adjacent possible, but now we've unlocked this thing. And we actually, it's, it's interesting, we stay within a very, very narrow space in complex chemistry, but now we've discovered there's a very large adjacent possible inside that narrow space. And that actually it opens up, right? The whole story of, of biological evolution is the exploration of what's inside that space, what's inside that territory. And by the way, this iterates. Inside uh, biology space, it turns out there's neurology space. Right? We can go into really cool detail about exactly what is the threshold where the emergence of the ability to constrain um, the coordination of a diverse number of perception and actuation agents, i.e. cells in a multicellular organism, to a dispositional orientation <laughs> move. Right. So photosensitive cells um, have this ability to... Uh, shift the input output uh, I guess algorithms of just um, effectively again stochastic behavior what, what do the cells do into a coordinated behavior known as behavior right so neurology gives rise to the beginning of an entirely new milieu in evolution space uh, which is behavior space this is all uh, Greg's stuff Greg does a great job here so Greg I'll, I'll put a link in the video all right so adjacent possible white sphere, red sphere, the actual trajectory, do you actually hit something where you've unlocked a new, a, a new move? Um, this notion of portal pathways, that there's moments where you can actually unlock an entirely new milieu, which is very narrowly within the legacy space. It's a very specific subset of legacy space, but actually by, by virtue of holding that particular location, so radically changes the probability landscape in the old space that you've actually opened up a whole new space um, which is superordinate to it, uh, by the way, behavior space, neurology space, now uh, there's a particular location in that known as culture space, a symbolic mediated coordination of biologically discrete social animals. Right? So you've got this capacity in neurology space to begin engaging in signaling that is uh, outside the body, right? and you can start coordinating social groups, so you start having social animals. In the context of social animals, there's a very specific zone where a certain level of perception and signaling capacity and bandwidth and all these other characteristics gives rise to this new thing called culture. Right? Now, in the context of culture space, there's a very specific narrow band that if you hit it just right, radically increases the, or radically changes the probability landscape and gives rise to a portal pathway to a whole new thing. Uh, that, by the way, is known as game B.